So in this video, I'll talk a bit more about conditional covariances, which we use in uh, SEM because we always assume data are continuous. So if a multivariate normality holds, then there's this very uh, nice thing you can do, which is called the Shear complement. And the Shear complement is awesome because you can use it to get any partial covariance. So that means the covariance between two variables conditioning on uh, anything solely in terms of uh, variances and covariances. And that is really nice. Uh, I uh, often make this argument when I'm teaching network analysis as well. If you have, say, a sigma, like a variance covariance matrix of the data, then this sigma also implies all conditional relationships because of the shear complement. That means that we can test all these conditional relationships um, that we uh, talked about in the previous video using the shear complement and so using the sigma. So we don't need anything else. That's for observed data only. We're going to have latest variables now, so it's going to be a little bit more complicated. But it's generally the same uh, idea. That also means that if sigma fits the data, then all implied conditional relationships between observed variables are also true, which is really strong. Okay, so uh, the shear complement looks like this. And here these are vectors. So this says the covariance between a vector y and a vector yj. So these are two sets of variables. Right, so let's just say we, we can also say these are variables themselves, right? So, uh, univariate, but there could be more. So, you can do uh, a covariance matrix of a set of variables with a set of other variables given a third set of variables, right? But you can also read them um, as in the univariate cases, in this case, would be the simply uh, single variables. So, that's the covariance, so that's the covariance matrix, right? Uh, the marks of covariance between these two variables, sets of variables minus the covariance times the inverse of the variance matrix of x times the covariance again uh, but then uh, in the other way around uh, sorry this is the covariance of x with yj and this is the covariance of x with yi in the univariate case so in case we only have three variables that's really the case we're only going to concern ourselves with here uh, this is a bit easier because this inverse is simply dividing by a variance. So then it's the covariance between two variables minus the product of the covariances of these variables with x divided by the variance of x. And this will allow us to get the conditional covariance between any two variables in, um, in your uh, model. So that really means that we can get all these conditional relationships, as I already said, uh, uh, in terms of sigma. And uh, if you want to have conditional relationship with the variable there, we need to also compute those variances. But I'll, I'll come back to that in the slides as well. So this is really powerful because this means that if you fit the SAM model, you simultaneously test all conditional independent relationships implied by the model. And that's really powerful. So in the last video I showed you, okay, we have this deck. And we have multiple variables, and it implies a whole set of relationships, maybe like a hundred hypotheses that we can test, that are derived from that causal model. So we have one causal model we draw it. It actually implies a hundred testable things. And then by simply fitting the SEM model, we are immediately simultaneously also fitting that. Because if those hypotheses do not hold, then the SEM model uh, may not be accurate. Which is an extremely powerful thing for such equation modeling. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So here we have a very simple SEM model. You know it, of course, as a CFA model. And this implies a certain set of uh, variances and covariances. We know that we can uh, use our formula for that, or we can use uh, the path tracing rules for that as well. Right, so let's say the variance of y equals uh, theta 1, 1 plus 1 times psi times 1, right? So theta 1, 1 plus psi 1, 1. The covariance of y1 with, let's say, y2 equals uh, this 1, 1 times 1 double-sided arrow times that one. So that's psi 1, 1 times lambda 2, 1. The covariance of y1 with eta, so the covariance of this one with eta, that's simply this one times 1 double-sided arrows. That's 
psi itself. Uh, the variance of eta is psi, we already knew that, right? So we can get all these building blocks that we need for our shear complement. Now let's use the shear complement to compute the covariance between y1 and y2, so y1 and y2, given that we condition on eta. Right, so that's the shear complement, that's this expression here. So then we can see, okay, so we have the covariance between y1 and y2, that's what we have here, that's psi 1, 1, or just psi in case you want to be lazy, that's fine, times lambda 2, 1, or lambda 2. And then uh, minus the covariance between y1 and eta, that's plus uh, psi, times the inverse of the variance of eta, that was psi, times lambda 2, 1, uh, psi 1, 1, that's the covariance of eta 1 with y2. Now what we see here is that this is the, uh, oh, this is the inverse of this cell, so this just strikes out, right? So that's removed, and then we're left with psi 1, 1, lambda 2, 1, minus lambda 2, 1, psi 1, 1, which is the same thing, because these are simple uh, variables, right? Uh, univariate set variable, so then we're left with zero, exactly zero, right? So that means that the conditional covariance of y1 and y2 after conditioning on eta equals zero. And now we proved that with our SEM model and with the setup of our SEM model, we proved local independence. That's nice because we know that was already the idea that these things are conditionally independent given eta, and that all covariation between y and y, y2 are therefore caused by this psi, right? So you can also already see in this expression, of course, here, right? So if psi is zero, then uh, you have no covariance, for example. But it's also nice to see that this actually holds up as well. So this is exactly zero. All right, let's do another SEM diagram. So here we have the chain, x causes y1 causes y2. So from the previous video lecture, you should now know that x is independent of y2 given y1. Yeah? All right, so we can use our path tracing rules to get this set of questions here. Right, for example, the variance of y1 equals, uh, let's say, this loop here plus that one square, that this loop times that one, right? And now we can use the shear complement again. So let's say the covariance of x with y2 given y1 is the same expression again. And then we just fill in all these, uh, these things here, right? And then uh, what we see here is that um, after rearranging some terms, we get zero. So we again proved that this is true, right? That this indeed makes these two things independent from each other, which is nice, right? So our SEM model is in line with, uh, with these causal statements and with these conditional independencies apply, uh, that are implied according to the DAG, which should be the case, but it's nice to see. All right, now finally, let's take the collider structure. So here we have x1, here we have x2, and let's say their covariance is zero, right? So x1 and x2, maybe this is like the motivation and difficulty of class and motivation of students, their covariance is zero, and this might be great, why? There's a residual here on it as well, and we have some beta1 or beta2. All right. Or you can call them gamma or something like that. I think I did it in the last slides. It uh, doesn't matter that much. So we can use our path tracing rules or simply the formula to get these expressions. Um, and then we can use the uh, shear complement. So now we get the covariance of x1 and x2 given y. So we're conditioning on y here. Is the covariance between x1 and x2? Well, that's zero, right? Covariance of x1 and x2, that's zero minus this whole thing here, and that thing turns out to be this expression here. All right, so let's take a look at that. Um, 
and let's assume that um, these two are both positive. Why is it difficult if class leads to higher grade? Uh, uh, difficult if class leads to lower grades. Well, let's say easiness of class then. Easiness of class leads to higher grades and motivation of students leads to higher grades. Let's say they're both positive. Then we can see that the variance here, clean this up a bit, the variance here is above zero because it's a variance. This thing here is above zero because it's a variance. This thing here is above zero. This thing here is above zero. And then here, this whole thing here is also above zero because um, right, this is also variance, right? So that means that this whole thing here is above zero. And there's a minus sign here. So then that, thing that means that this whole thing here is below zero. And it will be something. So in generally, in this case, this covariation will be below zero if you have um, uh, if you have uh, uh, effect of the same sign, All right? So sign is either minus one or one, and above zero if they're on different signs. And that's really remarkable. So that means that after conditioning on this y variable here, we induced if this is all above zero a negative correlation here. Oh. We induce a negative correlation here of like minus something, right? So a negative covariance, we can imply a negative correlation as well. And that's very interesting. It's a very important uh, thing. And this also, if you start looking for partial correlations, and we do that more in network analysis, where I talk a bit about next week as well, uh, you might see a very strong negative partial correlation here, even though you expect only to be positive things between things, because these might be like symptoms or so. And that might be because you're conditioning on the collider then. And this is actually a very uh, uh, well-known uh, problem as well, that the conditioning on a, um, a common effect leads to a certain bias, perhaps. It might not be bias, it's like it's also true, right? But it leads to a weird effect that you might not expect. It leads to a dependency arising between two effects. And that's very important to know, because this is something that you see more often than you think. Last year, uh, a fellow student of you, Jill Delon, wrote this paper where we looked at uh, this collider bias in networks. So networks are also partial correlations, but are very similar to SEM diagrams. I'll talk a bit about that uh, next week, but they're very similar really to, uh, to having these arrows here. Not the same, but it's similar to that. And then uh, uh, what we looked at is um, well, the effect of uh, conditioning on a collider. Not necessarily in the network itself, what we looked at is something that we see a lot in clinical psychology, where people are um, looking at the uh, effect between two variables in the clinical population. And the clinical population then might be, for example, the people that have clinical depression. Now, how do you have clinical depression? Well, you have nine uh, symptoms. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In the DSM, like you need to have one, like the depressed mood, and then you need to have four out of five, uh, eight of the other ones. So maybe if you have like, uh, let's say, these symptoms, you have depression. Right. So how do you define that? Well, in the data, if you have these nine symptoms, you are actually creating a uh, a, a tenth variable, which is called the sum core, and that's literally a common effect. Right, it's like exactly a common effect. Then, if we select only people based in that uh, clinical population, we say some score has to be higher than five or at least five. We are conditioning on this sum score. And if we then want to look at the covariance between these items, it doesn't matter what we do, right? We can do a network, we can do a factor model on this, anything. Then we induce all kinds of weird correlations in there. So if these things were actually um, not correlated before this conditioning, then suddenly they're negatively correlated. And that creates a certain bias called Bergson bias, right? And that's perfectly understandable from, um, from this uh, uh, con uh, collider effect. Uh, so that means that you have these negative correlations. And that's a weird thing because it's not really biased, because in this population, that's uh, actually true. 
Right. Another example I like is the example of uh, American uh, colleges where you have, let's say people are let in either because of very good intellectual ability, like Harvard, for example, but you also have like a sports fellowship, right? You have extreme good athletic ability. Now, if you're already let in because of a, uh, um, a intellectual ability, you probably did not need that extreme Olympic uh, athlete level uh, athletic ability to be let into Harvard. So then uh, you can predict that your athletic ability is actually lower than, uh, or it's actually just more on the average population level, right? Where if you are let into Harvard because of your athletic ability, maybe you had not the extreme high intellectual ability that you need to get into Harvard. So in that subpopulation, that negative correlation is actually true. But usually here, people are not actually interested in the population five out of nine symptoms. They're interested in people with depression, whatever depression is. So then it's clearly a, a bias, right? And that's uh, something that uh, with this in mind, you should also understand now, and it will also be important for SEM models. But it also means you cannot just do a SEM model on symptoms that you also use to select your population on because you get this collider effect. All right, so here in, uh, here's an example of that in the paper where we have a very uh, simple simulation here of two clouds, right? So we have like, uh, here and here, let's say these are two popula uh, populations, yeah, where uh, people with depression say have a bit higher level on efforts than on guilt and sadness than others. But if we now use the sum score to uh, select the population, right, so that means that we literally just say, okay, we uh, cut out this part, for example, we're going to have many gray um, uh, poles left here, so many people from the severe population. But some from the normal population that we're missing out on the people that were below the threshold. So then what you see is we suddenly miss a whole part here. And if you fit a line to that, it will be negative. But that's uh, completely induced by this uh, common effect structure. Now, in this paper also, uh, a few things that we look at is uh, what if you have other um, if what if you do uh, other things than uh, conditioning on the sum score, right? So here we have this problem with A and B and we condition on the sum score, then you get a negative correlation there or you get some bias. But you can also think about more uh, complicated tasks, right? So here we have two symptoms, let's say symptom A and symptom B. And let's say we have two questionnaires, so questionnaire A and questionnaire B, right? And let's say we don't select people on the sum score from questionnaire 1, or like, like 1. But we uh, select them on the questionnaire two. Right, so then we ask a different questionnaire, we take a sum score from them. But then we should take into account that these measures are still measures of the same symptom. So if this is the true model, the symptom A is causing both your response on the first and the second question. Right? So let's say questionnaire one asks, do you have depressed mood for the last three months? Questionnaire two asks, do you have depressed mood for the last three months? Right? So the, the thing in the line is the same. Then this sum score here will still be a sum score. And if you condition on this, we still have a common effect that we're conditioning in. So we're inducing a correlation here. And uh, that means that there is not a blocked path, as you will, from here to here. So then uh, you can even do the math, math if you want to, but there's still a correlation left between these two, even if these two are uh, conditionally independent. Now, um, then we look at... Um, um, conditioning on other symptoms of the disorder. That might be uh, true, but if you then have the network uh, model, which I'll talk a bit more about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so here you might not have the bias, but here you might get it because you get a, a common effect structure still between the symptoms, which might arise to, uh, due to other cost effects. There. Okay, and uh, that's it for this uh, video lecture on uh, conditional co and uh, being able to compute them by hand.